Hello and welcome to the Sports Grab Podcast. My name is Ryan Walker and with me, as always, is the front foot specialist, Reuben Williams. How are you, mate? G'day, Ryan. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Always a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, thank you for bringing attention to my front foot. A straight drive is just about the only shot I can play these days. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad that we've got a cricket coach on the podcast today because I need as much help as I can get. Mate, uh, I think we're polar opposite because I literally can't hit the ball on the front foot. I uh, My front foot resume really is only the block. So it's great that we had a cricket coach John because I've actually asked him that when he's in Melbourne next, we'll be going for a session in the net. So Absolutely. it was awesome. Um, well, it is awesome that we've got such an, uh, a quality guest on today. Um, before we kick off, message from our good friends at Deakin University where every single course is backed by industry experts. So you can be confident that you'll get the job you want with a degree employers want. Deakin University, progressive real world learning. Ryan, the show would also not be possible without our good friends from Sports Where I Am. Head to sportswhereiam.com to find all your tickets for events coming out this summer. There's a terrific series between Australia and England going on in the cricket here in Australia. And there's international events all around the world that Sports Where I Am cover. So jump on there and use the code SPORTSGRAD for 5% off your tickets. Awesome deal. Um, if you want to learn more about who we are or want to ask us any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. You can find a link to do so in the show notes. All right. We did mention Cricket Coach before. Uh, so who have we got on today, Rubes? Right, we're talking with Tom Scolle today. Tom is a former professional cricketer who played over in Perth and over in England, as he'll tell you all about. And during his professional career, he got cut short. He didn't get offered a contract and his potential wasn't filled out to the point that he felt it could be. And that drove him to become the mentor that he wished he had. And so he started this incredible coaching business that has got hundreds of thousands of followers literally all around the world who are learning how to play cricket because of him. Like when I, I he's literally got what 130,000 followers on Instagram, 60,000 on yeah. YouTube. There are a lot of cricket coaches, not many do it in the way that he has done it. And so um, there's a lot of good stuff to, to pull from Tom. He's a professional athlete. He's a business person. He's an entrepreneur. Like he's just an all rounder at a lot of great things. So this chat was fascinating for everyone, anyone who loves a good story. Yeah, Tom is a great guy. Um, I can't wait to uh, to get that batting lesson when he's over here. What are some things that stood out to you, mate? Well, firstly, just how he built a business out of his passion. Like, if you told me when I was 10 years old that you can be a professional uh, cricket coach and you can build a business out of that, I would have said, how good? Absolutely. Where do I sign up? Um, but I just didn't think it was possible. He's been able to do it. He's been able to create a business model that suits um, his lifestyle and his talents, which lie in cricket coaching. And so I think just getting an idea of how he operates his business is uh, fascinating. Yeah, I, I loved his uh, his six principles to success, a uh, little methodology that he's built. Um, he, he mentions on there, you know, how he built that, but it, it stems from, you know, having, you know, cricket coaches in the past and the way that they did it and what he thinks is, you know, probably a better method for it. And it's not just uh, technical, not just tactical. There's there's a lot of other things that go into, um, you know, how to succeed in, in cricket, but also in life. I think, he, I think he mentioned you can use this in many facets. And I think one he said was your first date. So for those out there who might be going on dates, Listen into the six principles of success. It's uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and finally, like it, it is just such an inspiring story. Like he's gone over, had a crack, lost his contract. It could have been easy for him to you know go and do any old job, but his failure as a professional cricketer, and I say failure, he's gone on. He's played at Lords. Like that is extremely good. <laughs> yeah, but he's hit like 180 in a county game. Like yeah, he's a superstar. He's a superstar, <laughs> and but still plays. And still plays, played 200 first class games and, um, or grade cricket games. And, um, 
he's been able to turn that failure as a player into success as a coach and a business person. And I think for anyone who's trying to overcome anything or is looking for inspiration and ideas on what to do, Tom is an incredible case study. Great. Well, grab a pen and enjoy this chat with Tom Scola. Skulls, welcome to the Sports Code podcast. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Skulls, it's awesome to, to have you on. We've been following you for a long time. Even before we started talking, as an amateur cricketer trying to better myself every year, I had heard a lot about cricket mentoring, watched a lot of your videos. I think there are other people who have put those videos into practice much better than I have, but to be chatting with you um, is awesome. Um, but before we get into cricket mentoring, why don't you tell us a bit about your career as a cricketer? Yeah, well, that's probably a good place to start because I first and foremost was a cricketer, still am a cricketer um, before I've moved into what I'm doing with cricket mentoring. So uh, pretty stock standard like most kids. I grew up in Alice Springs, played, I played soccer in the um, winter, cricket in the summer. And then from about 10 or 11, um, well, I started playing cricket when I was 10, so a little bit later than some. But um, And then from about 11 or 12, cricket sort of started to take a priority. Um, I, I obviously, cricket's always on the TV in the summer um, and soccer. Growing up in Alice Springs, the pathway to playing professionally was was not very straightforward. There was You had to get over to England and whatever. And whereas cricket, you could sort of go to national carnivals, represent the Northern Territory, and then there was grade cricket, and then there was the getting into the Australian team. So growing up in Alice, big dreams and goals of playing for Australia one day. Um at 16, I, I moved away from home for six months. I went and lived up in Darwin and was part of the Northern Territory Institute of Sport program, um, which I was actually reflecting on the other day and thinking how supportive my parents were to let me leave home at 16. I initially wow. boarded, boarded at a school and then went and lived with um, a guy who's been my best mate ever since. Um, so, and then in my sort of going into year 12, uh, just turned 17, my mum and I sort of looked out where I could move to as soon as year 12 finished to pursue my cricket. I had opportunities having represented the Northern Territory all through underage cricket. I had opportunities to pretty much go to anywhere in Australia. Different people had said, come and play here. And we decided that Perth was the best option. Um, I've got two uncles here. Um, and so we came over in the September school holidays before my final exams in year 12 met with Melville Cricket Club and then a week before I turned 18 I came over to Perth um, to play grade cricket um, and I've lived in Perth ever since. I then when I was 20 I went and played in England. Um, I ha ended up having six English summers playing in England. Um, in my second at the end of my second season in England I got a, a trial with Middlesex. Uh, I've got a British passport. Um, my father was born in England so I got a British passport. And part of me going over there was to pursue a career in England. Um, obviously, my goal and my dreams were to play for Australia. And I was playing grade cricket in Perth. But um, having not gone through the pathway system here in WA, I was a little bit behind some of the other guys. I was doing a bit better in grade cricket than some guys that were getting opportunities. But the, obviously, when you invest in young talent, you sort of want to see them through. And I understand that now. But... Um, so I got opportunities in England. I had a trial game, the last game of the season. It was a bit of a token game at the end of my second league season and walked out to bat in a second team game. It was rain interrupted, nearly didn't go ahead, but it got reduced to 26 overs a side. I walked out to bat. A guy called David Payne bowled the first over from Gloucestershire, who's still playing now. We're back in, we're back in 2009, so he's had a long, successful career. And I hit 24 off the first over. I hit three six. <laughs> I hit three sixes in the first over and all of a sudden I got the next day I got a call from the first team coach who invited me um, to come and have a meeting with him at the first team game and they invited me to come back and do pre-season with them the next year. Um, so I came back to Perth, played another grade season here in Perth and I wasn't doing that well. I'd, I'd scored a few hundreds but I was pretty inconsistent and then went back to Middlesex in March, a bit earlier than normal. Um, this was my third season in England. I did pre-season. I started the um, trialling with them, playing in the second team. Um, got got some runs. Uh, and then I got to about late June and, and the batting coach at Middlesex, a guy called Mark O'Neill, who's an Aussie, um, said to me, how are you going to make them sign you? And I said, oh, I don't know, keep scoring runs. He goes, no, no, you've got to get another county interested so that they can't just keep playing you for nothing. And, 
and then they'll sign you. And I thought, okay, he goes, who do you know? So I rang the coach of Hampshire who I'd known from, who'd done some coaching at my club in Perth. And he said, yeah, we'd love to have you down, come and play with us next week in the second team. So I went back to Middlesex and I said, um, I'm going to go and play with Hampshire now. And they went, no, 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 no. We, we want to keep you. And the second team coach said, I want to sign you. Just I'm trying to get you signed. Please just stay and play this next game. I've picked you for the next game and I'm going to try and get you signed. So I rang Hampshire and said, look, I'm going to play one more game with Middlesex um, and then I'll come down and play with you guys. And as it turned out, I got 180 in that game for Middlesex <laughs> um, against Gloucestershire again. And then at the end of that day, I got out late on day two of a three-day game. And uh, Angus Fraser, former England fast bowler now, um, or was the director of cricket at Middlesex, came and said, here's a two-and-a-half-year contract for the rest of this season and two more years. Um, so, yeah, I had, I had three amazing years, seasons at Middlesex as a professional. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get my contract renewed after that. I was a bit inconsistent, which I might go into a bit later. But um, I've continued to play grade cricket here in Perth. I've played over 200 games of grade cricket here in Perth, um, or first grade. And, yeah, I, I still still play. I, I'm sort of semi-retired, but I'm unavailable at the moment. I've just had my second child. I'm in my early 30s, so cricket isn't the priority anymore. But I, I'm an absolute cricket nuffy. I love the game, and, and the game has, and playing the game has, has given me so much. It's, it's given me my, my lifelong experiences and memories and also my best mates. So there's a, uh, a bit of a summary in a few minutes uh, about my career as a cricketer. Love it. So I take it. You're well and truly a bat. Uh, do you do you bowl at all? Or you just or, or where do you bat? You strike yeah. me as an opener. Yeah, so I, most of my career, so I am a bit of an all rounder. Um, I bowl off spin as well, but most of my career, um, I've opened or batted three. As I've gotten a bit older, I've slid down the order a little bit. So this season, I batted sort of anywhere from four to six, uh, or last season, I should say. Um, but most of my career, I identified as a top order batter, top three. Um, and then bowl some offies, which have gotten better as I've gotten older and, and they've kept me in the side at times when I'm not scoring runs. Um, but, yeah, I, I love being able to do both. Um, nothing special with the offies, um, but, yeah, just try and dart through a few overs quickly and, and keep the, the scoreboard um, tick, not, not ticking over too much and just try and – my goal as a bowler is to just get another over. So, um, yeah. yeah, but mostly a batter. I, I certainly know the feeling about dropping down the order, you know, of – I think a few games ago, I was number eight, traditionally uh, open the batting. So, yeah, totally know the feeling. Um, just a little less quality on my end. But let's get on to post-cricket. Uh, your professional career ended when you were 24. Um, what did you do next? And did you feel at all lost now that you were sort of outside professional cricket? Yeah, absolutely. I am. Um, so, as I said, 22 I was when I got offered my contract and at, at September sort of I was 24 I was told oh we no longer need you at Middlesex and, and Middlesex is one of the bigger counties in England based in London at Lords um, they have one of the biggest squads staff so you, do you make 180 at Lords no 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 that was a second team game at Radlett a, a club side I, I wish it was at Lords I um high yeah, score I at Lords <laughs> Highest score at Lords was my debut, a uh, list day debut of 32. I got run a ball 32 against Yorkshire. Um, well, I'll, I'll take one at Lords. <laughs> yeah, it, mate, it was it was incredible. And I've actually just as a side note, I've, I've written an article on our website um, about the, the my debut um, was against Bangladesh. So I had an amazing week. I had an amazing week where I got the 180. I got given my contract on a Thursday, and they said you're going to play against Bangladesh at Lords on Sunday in your debut. And so when a touring side comes, it's just like they often don't put out, like the county side doesn't put out their best team because it doesn't count for points or anything. They give a few young guys a go. So I was batting five and we had um, David Milan, uh, who's England test player, batting three, and O.A. Shah, uh, England, former England player, batting four or vice versa. And But the night before, I, I sort of, I played club cricket on the Saturday, I think, and the game was the Sunday. And then I, I normally have a few beers on a Saturday night after club cricket. I didn't. Went home, went to bed early, but I could not sleep. I literally had 40 minutes sleep the night before my debut. My mind was racing, <laughs> couldn't control my emotions. Um, so as it turns out, we fielded first. Um, I don't know if I took a catch or not that day, but fielding on Lords, it was amazing. I had... I think I had 30 um, of my mates and family who were in England come and watch, and it was incredible. But then batting at number five, we lost two early wickets, and then Shah and Milan put on a partnership. I was next in the bat, sitting on the 
um, balcony at Lords, and I was falling asleep. I was dead set, oh. I was dead set, like trying to watch the game. Try and I'd like stand up, <laughs> I'd run around, and I'd try and like get myself going, and I'd sit back down for a few minutes, and then I'd like sort of. Oh. And then anyway, the wicket, the wicket fell. I think M- Milan got out, so I went and then grabbed my helmet, walked down the stairs through the long room, <laughs> out onto the field. And you're well and truly alive then. I certainly wasn't asleep at that point. But then didn't last long. I only got three. I remember getting off um, off the mark with a single, I think, off Shakib Al-Hassan, who's the, the captain of um, Bangladesh and one of the best players in the world. And then I got out playing a slog sweep, which was one of my better shots, but I just didn't execute it. Trundled back and the, the sort of the men in the um, long room are all still clapping. And, <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was pretty fortunate. I played, I think I played about 20 first team games in white ball cricket for Middlesex and, Five, six, seven, or eight of them were at Lords. So I was at, yeah. And I did 12th man at Lords um, for the first uh, for the first team another 20 times and trained there a number of times. So for a boy coming from Alice Springs um, to play at Lords was pretty bloody special. But going back to your question, Ryan. Um, Rube's distracted us with the Lords. Well, that was unbelievable. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, it's it's a rabbit hole that we could go down for a whole podcast. <laughs> no, I could do a whole podcast on the lunches at Lords. <laughs> oh, I think we need to have a, a Tom Scully, like almost like a series, just to break <laughs> down all things Lords. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That would, that would I, unfortunately, well. mate, there'd be better people to get on than me. I only was there for a couple of years, but one of my good mates, Sam Robson's been a, a first team player for fifteen years, and he's he. he I've got a few. I've got a few good stories as well that I probably can't tell on the podcast. But um, <laughs> countless Lord sandwiches. Mm. Yeah. Well, you, so you, you've had this incredible experience, and then, then it's been taken away from you pretty quickly. So it's no wonder you're feeling lost. Yeah. So I, like, and I, I'm. I've got a pretty optimistic, positive outlook on life as it is, and that's sort of I think the way I was brought up. So, um, just backtracking a little in in the year in the season between my second season at Middlesex and my third. So I was still contracted. I came back and played in Perth. I got the most runs in the WACA first grade competition. I got 820 runs at an average of 82, three big hundreds. Um, And at the end of that season, I played a second 11 game for WA. Um, So I went back to England with these high hopes of doing really well. I had an okay year, but it rained a lot that year, 2012. I think we lost like a third of the days of cricket. We lost for rain. So it was hard and then the wickets were challenging. But I just didn't score enough runs. No excuses. Lost my contract. So when Angus Fraser told me, Tom, we're not renewing your contract, I was actually okay because I thought, oh, well, my goal is still to play for Australia. I'm 24. I'm coming into my best cricket. Last season in Perth, I was the best player in the competition. If I keep getting runs, I'll I'll play for WA and I'll I'll play for Australia. So that was my outlook. Um, A lot of guys who lose their contract at Middlesex or Surrey, they might find themselves at a smaller county. Um, they might try and go and trial or get a contract at a, a smaller county. That never crossed my mind. I never thought about going back to England to play county cricket at another county. I was like, right, WA is where I'm going to make it. Um, I'm an Aussie anyway. Um, unfortunately, I, I just didn't score enough runs. But in And that happened over the next couple of years. But in, in that period, I definitely was lost. I came back to Perth without the sort of the safety of a, a professional contract in England. And um, I, I got a job. I'd been working at, a, at an organisation in Perth that helps people with disabilities. I'd been coming back and doing different roles for them each each summer to just tick things over. And, um, yeah, I was work, actually was working as a receptionist at 24 for them. Um, my wife, my now wife, encouraged me to start a university degree and do a uni degree. So... I took on an online uni degree. I started doing economics. Um, that's what I enjoyed at school. But soon, quick, I quickly realised that there was a lot of writing involved in economics and I didn't enjoy that so much. So I, I shifted to an accounting degree. Um, but, yeah, like I was still chasing my dreams of playing cricket at sort of for the next few years, 25, 26, while, um, yeah, playing at a first grade level. So training three, four, five times a week, trying to keep myself as fit as I could working full-time, studying full-time, and then after that, a few years later, I started doing some coaching as well. So, But it was a tough time. I think I think in that, that sort of initial period after losing my contract, it was some, some down days. But then, as I say, I was really focused on doing well in WA. And as that started to slip away, that's probably when, when like, yeah, things started to hit home that maybe my professional career was over. But yeah, I, I, I've been very fortunate. Cricket's given me so many great things, I've already said, so I can't complain. Mm. 
Well, look, looking back and in, in retrospect, it kind of looks like you were able to find that purpose or meaning within cricket in somewhere else. So, so I'm wondering if you'd be able to explain, you know, why did cricket mentoring get started and, and what were some of the first steps that you took to get it off the ground? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. It was quite organic, really, in that um, in two, so 2012, I lost my contract. 2013, I went back to England in the in the Australian winter, played another club season because my now wife was living in England and we did long distance for six months. So I decided to go back and be with her. And then I said to her, come and live in Australia. Let's just settle down in Australia and I'll stop doing this back and forth, back and forth, which I'd done for six years. So it was, it was the winter 2014. It was my first winter in WA because I'd grown up in Alice and ever since I'd moved to WA, I'd been going and playing cricket in the winter. I had a few seasons in Darwin before I went to England. And so um, we, we started to rent a little flat around the corner from where I'm now here in South Perth. And I was going for a run around the river one night and I ran into an old teammate of mine, my old captain, a guy called Scott Muleman who had played for WA and he owns the Muleman's Cricket Centre. And I just said to him, oh, look, Scotty, I'm thinking about doing some coaching just for a bit of extra income. Can you get me some clients? And he goes, yeah, no worries. We'll, like, we'll, we'll take you on as one of our coaches at Muleman's. They got two indoor nets there. And and I just started doing And so a week later, I got a phone call from a dad who had called Muleman's. I got into Muleman's and said, I want some coaching for my young 13-year-old. And Muleman's passed on my number. So I booked a session that Friday and I did my first coaching session. And I'd done a bit of coaching before, especially over in England as an overseas pro. Part of your package is to do some coaching. And I'd never really enjoyed it, um, really enjoyed it. Like, I didn't mind it. And when I was younger, I'd done some tennis coaching when I was a teenager in Alice Springs. Um, and I just went to this session expecting to sort of like get get a bit of extra money and whatever. And But the, the, I got a real buzz out of helping this boy who was pretty good um, at 13, but I got a real buzz out of helping him get better and suggesting something and him doing it and, and it working. And, think, and I thought, wow, that was – and I, I loved it. And then the next week I got another call from another parent, so I had two sessions the following week and – and so for the next sort of year or so, it just it just organically grew through Muleman's referring clients to me, um, and I was paying them net hire. I was just paying Muleman's a net hire to use their their nets, and I would sort of um, yeah run these coaching sessions. And then I had my mates, my closest mates who were cricketers, say, "Oh, Scholes, get us some coaching. Can you get us some coaching? Like we want to do this." And and in the meantime, I was I was trying to help my athletes holistically. I was trying to like give them information on the mindset needed to be your best and the emotional skills and not just around technique technique which is what you do in the in the nets most of the time because upon reflection from my own career I realized that I wasn't successful not because I couldn't hit my cover drive or not because of my technique but because I couldn't control and manage my thoughts and my emotions and and that's why I couldn't sleep the night before my game my mind was just racing um, so I was trying to look for content to, to pass on. And I, I sort of created these folders for all of my players and I printed things out. I'd print out articles off cricket.com.au or Crick Info or something about Rahul Dravid's mindset or whatever. And I'd give it to them. I'd track, I'd do like little fitness tests for them and try and do all these things in my sort of 45 minute session. Um, and then, yeah, like it, it was, I think it was January 2016 that I, I founded Cricket Mentoring. I got um, I actually had another – this might be a story for another podcast, but I, 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 I – um, Chris Rogers and I tried to launch a business um, where we would take – we would take young people to Lords and to England to watch the Ashes. Um, Buck and I obviously both had a good relationship with the people at Middlesex at Lords, and, and he was playing for Australia at the time. It was his idea. Long story short, that fell through. It was all over the media. I'll tell you boys about that another time, but Buck had to – during the Ashes that year, Buck had to come out and apologise. Not that we did anything wrong, um, but he had to sort of say, look, I was a bit naive. So I had this business set up, this company set up for that, and then I sort of was going to call it that as well. And then some, I, I sort of had this meeting with the business coach and he said, no, you've got to make your name relevant. And then so when I was setting it up, I thought cricket, obviously, and mentoring was a word that was I was seeing everywhere in business articles in the business world, but I wasn't reading it much in sport. And I thought, well, I, that's what I want to do. I want to mentor people. I want to not just coach them. So I, I founded Create Mentoring July, sorry, uh, January 2016. My brother-in-law is an app developer and he helped me sort of develop a WordPress website. And looking back, I should have launched 
cricket mentoring then and there as we founded it, but we didn't launch until August because, and I was still coaching in the background. I was still doing my private coaching, but cricket mentoring wasn't launched to the public until the 2nd of August when I hit post on a uh, Facebook um, post. I hit publish um, because we were trying, I was trying to get every image perfect, all the pages right. And in hindsight, knowing what I know now, I would have done just launched with one page and, and sort of built on top of that. But yeah, we launched in July 2016. Um, our, our, I started to then post content on, on our socials, on, on Instagram and so forth. And I remember getting like a huge thrill when we hit a thousand followers and, and so forth and thinking, wow, this stuff, like people relate to this stuff. People enjoy this stuff. And then my coaching just started to grow. Word of mouth was sort of growing. Our, we were, our digital stuff was growing. And then in July 2017, um, I was heading over to England to get married and I, I quit my full-time job then to uh, to go full, full-time with cricket mentoring and I started a vlog, um, just started pumping out heaps more content. So, yeah, that's sort of how it all was born, I guess. That's awesome. I, I love how it all comes back to that one net session with that 13-year-old boy and just seeing yeah. the impact you're able to create. And now you've created a community of hundreds of thousands of people who are learning from you all over the world. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like when you sort of say that, it is, it is, you sort of, I'm sure with you blokes, you get a bit like as you see the numbers grow, they just like you sort of take it for granted. And you see, I want more, I want more. And when you sort of do sit back and say, wow, yeah, we're impacting quite a few people around the world, it, it is pretty cool. And we're very, and I'm always grateful that we're in a, in a time where I can spend an hour or however long creating a piece of content, hit publish, and it can go anywhere. Um, mm. and, and I sort of, I think that was a big part of the early days was what's me having the insight to say, well, why can't I reach people in Kenya? Why mm. can't I reach people in England, mm. anywhere in the world if I publish content? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think like what, what are the great things for students listening to this? And we've kind of been through this a bit as well that in that, when you create your own channel and content, you're giving yourself a project that you can talk about down the track. For people listening to this podcast, they're going to end up in a job interview and need things to talk about. If you create your own project like Cricket Mentoring and it just does okay, you can still talk about it and leverage it. Like People are still going to look at that and think, all right, that guy started a thing. It went reasonably well. You know, He's probably got enough initiative to do what we want him to do. But then if it goes really well, you never have to apply for that job and you can just stay doing what you've done. Um, and I, th I think it's such an inspiring story for anybody thinking about starting a channel on whatever their topic of interest is and just giving it a go and seeing where it could end up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's like, yeah, we're just there. And, and the, the sort of the social media space is becoming more and more and more crowded. When I started, there was no cricket coaches on Instagram. Now there's millions um, trying to do what we're doing. And but if you're, if the thing that separates everybody is our own unique story, our own unique perspective on the thing that we love. So if you can be authentic and, and bring your opinions and your ideas to whatever it is you do, whether it's coaching or whether it's knitting or whatever your little niche is then, yeah, absolutely. And um, there's no, no doubt that there'll be people that resonate and relate to your sort of ideas if you're trying to give value. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned it's important to be unique and, and be yourself and that, that's how, you know, you can appeal to so many people. Chat us through sort of what does Cricket Mentoring do to, to help so many people? Well, yeah, so first and foremost, we're, we're cricket coaches. We sort of, we help cricketers develop their skills. But what we what we talk about at Cricket Mentoring is like, and this is something I've learned post um, my professional career. Since I lost my professional contract, I, I really became a student of success and peak performance and high performance and studied like why do some people perform well under pressure and I wasn't able to. Why do some people, why are some people consistent? What makes the best so good? And I've tried to really, really pay attention to those little things that separate the best from the rest. And so um, I've, I've sort of, we've come up with this framework that we believe there's six pillars to success. And, and I think this can be applied to most things in life, but in sport, definitely. Tactical is the first, uh, sorry, technical is the first pillar. You all need to build a builder. A foundation, a good foundation, and that's built around your technique. So if you're a batter, it's your sort of balance and your bat swing. 
bowling, um, it's your sort of run up and your sort of straight lines, etc. That's your technical. The tactical pillar is the number two. You have to understand the game and how to implement those skills, that, that technique you've got. And then that, that those two are sport specific and they sort of stay with whatever your sport is or whatever you're doing in that skill set. They don't like if you know um, the game of cricket really well, that's not going to help you in a job interview really. But the other four, mental, emotional, physical and lifestyle, they can go with you everywhere. Your mental and emotional skills can go with you into a job interview. They can go with you into a big exam or um, your first date, your physical sort of um, how fit and healthy you are goes with you everywhere you go. That gives you energy or, or, or um, sort of makes you tired if you're sort of not physically fit. And then your lifestyle is all about the habits and behaviours that are either sort of help or hinder you perform at your best. So I didn't know this when I was younger. When I was younger, I spent all my time in the nets and trying to learn the game. And I knew that I had to sort of be a professional athlete. I had to sleep well and eat well. So I knew the lifestyle. I knew that if I was fit, I'd perform better. But I did not understand the power of my mind and how it sort of um, impacts how I feel, which impacts how I how I play. So we talk to all of our athletes about the six pillars of success, and we, we do that through a range of things. We do in-person coaching here in Perth. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. We've got, enough, got a number of fantastic coaches now. We run camps with groups um, in school holidays, but we're starting to run them on a weekly basis through sort of terms. We do online coaching and mentoring. I do one-off sort of coaching sessions with the odd person here or there, but then I have online mentoring clients who I speak to every week and we, we go through that. That focuses on all six pillars, a little bit on technique, but mostly on those other pillars. Um, and then like you guys, we have an online community where we sort of, it's a monthly subscription for those serious and committed cricketers who want to just have somewhere to go and constantly learn and upskill themselves. Um, and then on top of that as well, we have one-off courses or programs as well where people can go and get a batting course or a strength and conditioning course or we've got a course with Josh Philippi that goes into his sort of mindset, his game plans, those sort of things. So we're trying to appeal to serious and committed cricketers. I think your park cricketers, that they probably follow more the grade cricketer and have, have a laugh, have fun, but which is great. And, and I hope that they get the most out of themselves and the grade cricketers uh, is doing some amazing things. But... Um, we're trying to help those, the young version of myself. And, and something that I say a lot on our socials is I'm trying to be the mentor that I wish I had because I feel like I had some good coaches, I had some good senior people um, around me, but I, if I had a consistent person to talk to and ask questions of, then I feel like I might have performed at my best more consistently and therefore my, I might have had a longer professional career. So, um, and, and now I'm, I'm going out and I'm giving a lot of talks to clubs and schools um, I've done four talks in the last week to different clubs and schools around the six pillars of success and around the mental and emotional skills primarily needed because all kids are getting coached on their technique, some better than others, but um, it's those mental and emotional skills that I wish I knew when I was younger. There's a few things that I, I love about that. Um, the first is, and this is something that's come up recently with people like Kimberly Furness, who's the general manager of People and Culture, at Netball Australia, and even, even Hamish McLaughlin talked about this, and I think Morgan Mitchell touched on it too. But a lot of their success has come out of things that have been meaningful to them, you know. And so for you, you know, your, your career has been built out of your own personal lived experience and how, you know, not having that mentor that could have taken you to the next level has driven you to be that mentor for somebody else. And I think... For a lot of people who are trying to find career direction, perhaps they're going through something that is then going to be the experience that creates a motivator to go and do something else. And sometimes you just need time doing that thing to find out what that is. And so I love that you're now fulfilling, um, you know, that purpose that you've created for yourself. The other one is the suite of things that you do. There are a lot of cricket coaches out there yeah. that you talk about. There aren't many that do it in the way that you do. You know, I remember going to down to... Uh, this centre in Blackburn in, in Melbourne and having one-on-one -on -one cricket coaching and I'd see him once a week. Um, I didn't do it for very long, but he would just, you know, say, hit the ball this way, go home, practice those things at home. And, and that was just about it. And you'd only ever see him at the cricket centre. You wouldn't see him on Instagram. You wouldn't see him on YouTube. You wouldn't see him pumping out all this free content and all these extra resources that you could tap into. Um, and then you wouldn't, you certainly wouldn't see him trying to create his own method of, you know, 
this is the way that I coach cricket. And so I love that you've packaged up everything that you've learned over, you know, 15, 20 plus years playing cricket um, and put it into a framework that people can easily follow. And you're attaching your name to it and saying, this is how I approach cricket and this is how you can get good too. And it's clearly working for you. Like, I think it's just such a great story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, the first thing I want to say on your point there is, yeah, my, my sort of, if I'd had a more successful career, career professionally as a player i probably wouldn't be running cricket mentoring and i feel like i feel like it probably happened for a reason and 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 part of the content um that i've been consuming recently to help me with my six pillars of success talks is there was a podcast where m murray who's a mindfulness coach she's worked with the richmond tigers and with um, will prakowski she's quite well known these days in the sports space there's um she says that we're all like we're all on our own journey and, and things work out the way they're supposed to work out. And she talks about how she was a netballer and she didn't make it or she wasn't as good as some of the others. And if she'd known then that the reason she probably wasn't going to make it would help her become the mentor that she now is, well, then she would have been sort of more okay with things. And if I'd known when I was 24 that, well, you haven't made as a player, but you're going to become this sort of mentor and coach and help others, well, then... Things, things do work out. So I think what you said about, yeah, like it's all like part of the journey is, is mm. absolutely true. Mm. And, and yeah, look, I think, yeah, I, I'm just really passionate about what I do. I'm really passionate about helping others live their best life and that's through cricket. So I, we sort of help cricketers, but we help more than cricketers now. We help parents, we help coaches. I'm helping other, uh, other athletes. I'm, I'm helping a few people in business. It's just trying to help people live their best life. And, and as I said before, it, we're so lucky that I think social media allows us to share our message. And, and in yeah. those early days, five, five plus years ago, I just decided I was just going to have a crack and, and try and be as everywhere. Um, for these sort of entrepreneurs and the online business people I was following who weren't sports people, they were motivating me and encouraging sort of the, their viewers to just put content out there, get content out there. You never know who's going to watch it. And, and fortunately, coming from a professional sports background and having good mentors myself, um, I think the messages that I share do resonate and do relate um, with with a lot of yeah the cricket community. What what's the size of some of your social media followings? Um, so we've got one hundred and thirty something thousand, thirty one or thirty two thousand uh, followers on in Instagram, and and that's been um, a wow. lot of time and effort. And we sort of we grew pretty quickly in the early days. It's been a really slow burn in the last 18 months. Instagram's algorithms changed. There's so much more competition on online now. So it's been a slow burn. We got to a hundred thousand pretty quickly, um, maybe a couple of years. And then, yeah, the last few years have slowed down. We're not posting probably as regularly as you need to, to keep growing with the algorithm these days. But I think we're up just over 60,000 subscribers on YouTube, which again is pretty wow. slow burn. Um, a bit over 200,000 followers on TikTok. Um, which is a, a platform that's growing really, really quickly. Um, 20 something thousand followers on our Facebook page. Um, but the, the hard thing is being a small business, which I'm sure you guys are fully aware of is, is I don't have a big team behind me. I don't have the sort of big team of cricket Australia or whatever. So I'm trying to go across all platforms, but it means you sometimes drop the ball and we probably mm. haven't gone as big on some platforms because we're trying to go wide rather than just go deep and, um, maybe that's to my detriment, but I've tried to be everywhere. I've tried to tried to have a vlog. I've tried to have a, a podcast, two podcasts, in fact. Tried to have do posts on Instagram every day, and and sometimes it just gets too much. Um, but yeah, it's just this my sort of my plan is to just keep putting content in there. People will consume it if they want to. They'll scroll past it if they don't. Mm. And I've I've watched quite a few of your videos trying to improve my own amateur cricketing ability. They are high quality, and for anyone who needs help, that definitely check out the YouTube channel. How do you do this consistently at scale? Yeah, well, I think it's something I've invested in from the early days. I, I sort of taught myself how to do a bit of video editing. I bought myself a decent camera. I bought a microphone because in the early days, I realised I was filming some good stuff. I started just filming on my phone probably five years ago and their phones weren't that good back then. They were pretty good, but not that good. Then I realized I needed something with a zoom. So I bought a better camera. Then I realized, okay, I've got good video, but not good audio. No one can hear what I'm saying. So I invested in some mics so that you could hear what I'm saying. And that was a game changer that made our content sort of way, way better. But then just 
<coughs> excuse me, I, I was coaching a boy um, who was 14 at the time. And um, one day his mum said, oh, he can't make a session today. He's got some work on with the Perth Scorchers. And I was like, oh, what's he doing with the Perth Scorchers? And she was like, oh, he's their videographer. I nearly fell off my chair. I was like, he's only 14 and he's still at school. What do you mean he's, he's their videographer? And his mum was like, yeah, he's, he's a really good at video editing and filming and he does some work for the Scorchers. And so I was like, oh, I, can't going all out. I can't wait to see him next. So next session, like, started feeding him balls and, like, 10 shots in, he – I think he was hitting well, and I walked down and said, you're a videographer? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, mate, I'm trying to do this video thing myself. Can you help me? And so we did a bit of contra where, like, he would edit some videos and I'd give him free lessons. And then I started to employ him, and he was like, I want to do more work for you. I'll miss a bit of school. My parents are happy to support me because I'm not good at school and I'm a bit I'm better at this creative type thing. Like, they're happy to support that. And so... I paid him a little bit of money and, I, and he started becoming, he became my videographer. I took him to England with me. We traveled around England for two weeks. We, um, wow. we shot, we shot a pot, we shot heaps of podcast episodes. We did a piece of content where I batted in a microphone during a match. And he I've, was I've seen that. Movie. It's uh, it's compelling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one of our most viewed videos on YouTube. That's and that, so that good. had um, thousands, yep. thousands of comments and, and um, that was well received. And, and yeah, so I, I invested the money, the business was earning into sort of paying him a bit. Um, and then he actually had to leave Perth. His family moved to Mount Gambier in South Australia. So he, he moved and I was absolutely devastated. But that coincided with moving cricket clubs. Um, I moved from Melville here in Perth to, to Perth Cricket Club. And, and I think after the season launched the night before, round, the Thursday night before round one, Perth produced this amazing like video. And I, I messaged the captain of Perth and said, who's done this video? And he said, oh, it's this guy called Jacob Spur. So I reached out to this Jacob Spur and had a coffee with him the following week and he became my videographer so um <coughs> excuse me uh yeah it's just something i've invested in and, and i've had a, i've had spurry as our videographer for the last few years and it's something that i think has helped us grow i love that what, what a story what <laughs> the young fella's just come in for some batting lessons and he's become the videographer and he's snagged a trip to uh to england in uh in the process so yeah love it um yeah. I, I, I just think like content is how I share my message. So it's like, and, and I follow Gary Vaynerchuk and he always talks about taking a little bit less for yourself and reinvesting it into your business so you can grow. And I've had that sort of mentality from the start. I've, I've not paid myself a whole lot while I'm <clears throat> trying to get more staff and, and create better content, buy better equipment so that hopefully one day I've got a, a big sort of business um, at some point in the future. And we're not there yet by any means. Like we've got a, we've got a sizable following and we're doing lots of cool things, but we're certainly nowhere near where I want to get to yet. But um, yeah, I think just investing in videographers um, to create, to film and create the content frees up my time and it's better quality. And yeah, that's really helped us because mm -hmm. not only do we have a good message, I believe, but we we, pro we produce it in a, in a high quality way so people sort of, yeah, take us really seriously. Another good example that if you can create and produce content, you'll never be out of a job anywhere in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I um, I need to watch more of your videos because I can't actually hit on the offside. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I um, it appears all the lessons I had with mark bowler was his name in wa absolute legend yeah uh it appears all the lessons like they worked for a little bit but just didn't didn't stick like, uh, yeah no he's a, he, he was a very good coach i know a few guys who were coached by him i think we've had his son at our camp um uh, one of our camps a few times so yeah no he was a very good coach but yeah it's probably just not using your left side enough you're using your bottom hand too much yeah no nah, my, my foot doesn't go to the ball my head doesn't go to <laughs> my uh my my front legs so that's i know what the problem is just doesn't seem to fix it so underarms lots of underarms yeah mark mark bowler did actually tell me one time that i had one of the best pull shots he's saying <laughs> and I'm, I'm actually not joking that, that actually happened ruben uh even awesome. though i play h grade for white wycliffe <laughs> on uh carpet uh you don't bowl short sitting, of me should be sitting back trying to smack everything over that leg then that's often what happens and it somehow just doesn't continues not to happen for me anyway we, that's another podcast we could go on to for another another time but um i want to move back to the the content piece 
um, and the content you produce, a, a lot of it focuses on sort of like mindset and the, and the mental skills needed for an athlete to perform. Why do you think mental skills are so important? Because, you know, I, I've been told many times from career coaches, you know, the game's like 20 or 20% below your shoulders. But um, I can imagine it's the same for a lot of sports out there. So why is that so important? Well, to me, it's, it all comes back to my own story. Like on my day, I was as good as anyone else. I, I lived with um, a guy called Sam Robson. We played a fair bit of second team together. Um, he's from Sydney. He's a similar age to me. <clears throat> and like me, he's got a British passport. But um, after three years, I lost my contract. Um, and in 2014, he made his test debut. And on if I was at my best, I was just as good as him. I was picked in the white ball side um, more often than him because I was more dynamic. Um, and in all, in sort of the, the technical, the tactical, the physical and the lifestyle pillar, I, I was as good as him. Um, I was probably fitter than him um, and my lifestyle was probably better than his. But mentally and emotionally, he was well and truly above what I was. He could stay very level Um in the, in the big moments, he could sort of not get too overawed and not let his thoughts run away with what could happen. He could he could sleep before big games and then show up fresh and, and feel good. Whereas, as I've already said, that like I wasn't able to do that and I didn't even understand. I didn't even understand the importance of my mindset, let alone how to manage it so that I could perform at my best. So through my experiences, I know that had I been able to firstly understand it and secondly manage it, so that I could then show up in a state physically, mentally, and emotionally to perform perform at my best, I probably would have been more consistent, and I probably would have played for, had a professional career for longer. So for me, it's all about we've got this um, we've got this sort of graph that I've designed that you have time along the bottom axis, and you have your best along the sort of side axis, and we're always trying to move our best higher. We're trying to move from a beginner down here to world class up here. We're trying to move that up that way and we've drawn a red line so you're always trying to move along the red line and that happens over time over time you get better by going to the nets by practicing by learning more about the game by getting a bit fitter but on any given saturday we're trying to perform at our best in that moment and all we can ever do is try and bring our best to that moment an under 13 player who isn't a great batter isn't suddenly going to stand up and start batting like Manus Labashain and hitting balls down the ground because they're not at <clears throat> they're not at that level. So for me, the mental and emotion, emotional skills allow us, if we do use them well, if we understand them, they allow us to bring our best to each moment. And then any sort of every day we go back and we try and get better. We try and get our best a little bit better. And over time, many years, we move closer to world class. But if we don't understand this mental piece and how to manage our emotions, we rock up, we're anxious, we're tense, and we don't perform at our best then. And it, for me, it was a bit of a fluke. When when life was good outside of cricket, like I know that I play my best cricket when I'm relaxed and I'm happy and I'm calm. So if I rocked up the cricket as a young guy and that's just how I was because life was pretty good, then I would, I would maybe perform close to my best. It would just happen um, coincidentally. <clears throat> but... It would, wouldn't happen very often. So I wanted I want to help athletes get in that state more regularly so then their skills can perform. They can perform their skills to the best level that they're capable of in that moment. So, yeah, it's just, it's just I think that it's so, so crucial. And for me, it's because it's not tangible. You can't see improvement in mental skills. Um, it, it's something that – and not many people understand it. Not many people understand how to coach it or, or what it is. And so it's left. Um, and so for me – there's a big gap. And so that's why I'm pretty passionate about it. And that's why I'm trying to educate young athletes with it. So you've, you've been able to uh, identify the importance of mentoring and have built a business out of mentoring. Who are some of your own mentors? Yeah, I, I think in business, I've just recently engaged a business coach or mentor, which I think I should have done a long time ago because um, that's going to help me sort of get my business going to where I want it to go. Um, I think something I've been guilty of is trying to be everything for everyone. As I said, try and be on every platform and do it all well. And, and that means you, there's holes in things and I'm not doing them as well as I can. So I've just engaged the business mentor. But prior to that, I used to just sort of call, tell people I had digital mentors, guys like Gary Vaynerchuk and 
Michael Gervais, who does a podcast, just people who create content I would learn from. I'd consume business content, um, books, podcasts, articles, etc. And I would learn and try and implement those things into my own business. So that I had sort of digital mentors, but I've now got a physical person I, I engage with. But And then from a cricket side of things, I'm really fortunate that um, the relationships I've built in cricket um, I've been really, really strong. Um, I've got Chris Rogers as one of my best friends. He was a groomsman at my wedding. Um, he he is the coach of Victoria, former Australian cricketer, played over 300 first-class games and averaged 50 across that period. He understands batting better than most people in the world, and I speak to him most days about batting and about coaching. So he's someone I, I give him sort of a lot of advice at times about things that he uses, but more often than not, he's giving me a lot of advice and we're bouncing ideas off each other. And I'm learning um, what's happening at the top level, what's happening um, with the Victorian cricket team, what's he working on with Marcus Harris or Nick Maddinson and, and so forth. And I can take those lessons and implement them with them with my players. Um, Adam Vogis is a former teammate of mine, coach of WA. Um, I go to the gym with him every week. We're still good mates. Um, I, I speak to him every now and again. Um, and then yesterday I had a, a half an hour conversation with Greg Shippard, who's the coach of the Sydney Sixers. Uh, who have won the last two big bashes, and he's become a mentor of mine as well through having him as a guest on our podcast. So um, I'm really fortunate in cricket sense to have three of the best coaches in Australia sort of as my mentors. One's one of my best mates, and I speak to him regularly, but the other two I speak to every now and again. I learn from, I bounce ideas off. Um, but again, it's just being a student of the game, just trying to watch and listen and learn from anyone, anywhere, any anytime. I'm I feel like I'm not an expert. I'm always learning. I'm always evolving, always adapting my theories and my sort of thoughts. So, yeah, just being a student of the game and student of life, really. It's quite the uh, quite the list of mentors there. I think <laughs> there'd be a few people listening who are quite jealous of that list uh, because, you know, it, it is a walk in the park to, to get a really good quality mentor. So it sounds like you've got four just ready to go of, of the highest it's, it's, order. <laughs> And I think I think for anyone listening, obviously you've got sort of a lot of sports grads listening. It's it's a two way relationship. It's not like I just take from them. Like <clears throat> I'm always I, I'm always asking questions. And, it, and for me, I'm always I make sure I'm always grateful. I'm, I never say yeah, see you mate. Or whatever. It's always thanks so much for your time. Thanks for your thoughts. Thanks for your help. And 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 really being appreciative that they are helping me. But I try and give some value. Whether that's um, I, I can't give much value to Greg Shippard, who has seen it all, done it all. Coach Steve Smith and Ricky Ponding won more than ten titles in Australian domestic cricket. I don't know what value I can give him, but I think he likes to sort of he likes to, the feeling of helping a young, passionate coach as well. Um, but I make sure with Buck, we're always sort of sharing ideas and best practices, and I'm challenging him with what he's doing, and he's doing the same for me. And um, so yeah, I'm very lucky. Um, but it's, again, I think it's um, about building a relationship. Those people wouldn't be helping me if I hadn't built that relationship with them in the past. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, back to core cricket mentoring, what does the future hold? Good question. I've got to talk to my business coach and work it out. <laughs> we've, um, we've got the thing that I find, and I'm, I'm sure you blokes with, with sports grad are, are a bit similar, is there's so many opportunities. There's so many possibilities. It's just like time and energy is limited so where do we put our time and energy and as i've said a few times i feel like i've done things half-heartedly by trying to do too much so it's just trying to double down on what we're good at for me i've recently started doing these talks on the six pillars of success and i'm really enjoying them educating young athletes on the mental and emotional skills i've been into some high schools um i've been into some sports clubs etc so i want to be doing more of that um I take a lot of inspiration from Hugh Van um, Cullenberg, whatever his name is, from the, the Resilience Project. He's, he's built an amazing business, it seems, and, and shares a great message. So sort of go down that route a bit where we're getting into schools and clubs and talking about the mental skills for sports and performance and a bit of mental health. Um, we're, we're building a, a mental skills program at the moment, which we've had in the past. We actually, when we launched, we had a, a program called Peak Performance Program, which we're redeveloping, which will be ready in the next few weeks. Um, and then we're continuing to grow our, our pool of, of cricket players. Um, I've got some really exciting young players who are doing great things in the game. So we're just going to be patient with them, some 17 and 16 year olds. Um, just grow, growing our sort of, I'm, I'm going to keep investing in our coaches. Um, I'm throwing lots of balls myself at the moment, which is pretty taxing and tiring. 
Um, so I want to be investing in my coaches and upskilling all of my other coaches so that I can sort of give them um, the better quality players and don't have to do them myself. So just yeah, it's just it's just the never ending sort of journey, I guess, of like where do we where do we go? What do we do? But just yeah, the core building everything around the core pillars of helping the, the younger version of myself, helping the serious and committed cricketer move towards their goals, whether that's most of them have the goals of playing international cricket. Um, and hopefully, hopefully in three or four years, you'll see a handful of cricket mentoring athletes who are playing first class cricket. And then a, a bit beyond that, there'll be a few playing um, international cricket. So, yeah, uh, I think some exciting times ahead. Unreal. That's a uh, yeah, awesome plan of attack you've got. If you, if you could, um, you mentioned you got the business coach. If you could be your own business coach and go back to the start of your cricket mentoring journey and give yourself one piece of advice, what do you think it would be? I think it would be around don't be everything to everyone. I think it would be around like try and work out as quick as you can what your core thing is, what your main message is, and really be the expert on that. I think we've done that pretty well, but at times we've we've just tried to cater to everyone and, and it just doesn't work and your your main message gets lost a bit when you when you're trying to be doing too much. So I think that would be it. And I, and I would also say just start, like just start straight away and start getting your message out there quicker. I think if we'd started launch, if we'd launched in January 2016, we might have grown quite a bit quicker rather than um, August 2016. So just start. There's nothing to lose. And in those early days, I was I was a bit scared. Like you wouldn't know it now having been, done it for five years, but I was terrible on camera and I was really intimidated and scared to put my face out there and get judged. And I... I would just say to myself, like, people are going to respect you if you're authentic in your message. If you genuinely want to help people and you're authentic, you might get the piss taken out of you, and I promise you I had the piss taken out of me a number of times by my mates. Um, and, and some of them didn't take me seriously at the start and thought, oh, Skulls, you'll be done this. This is just a thing. But here we are five and a bit years later, um, and, and I've got enormous respect for my mates now for, for what I do. So um yeah just just if you're authentic and you genuinely care you genuinely want to help people then just have a crack um and don't worry about what other people think you, you can't control other people's opinions so just get on with it and have a crack <clears throat> awesome i love that skulls finally mate where can people find you uh social media at cricket mentoring on instagram i think tiktok we're at cricket underscore mentoring youtube cricket mentoring uh, our website, cricketmentoring.com, which we're sort of working on in the background. We're going to be updating in the next week or two. Um, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, Tom Scolle. I'm on Instagram myself, Skulls5. Um, but that's pretty much it. We're all over social. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get a few follows and hopefully we can give some value to cricketers out there. Unreal, mate. Well, it's been fantastic talking to you and just hearing about your journey in cricket. Um, you know, Ruben and I love cricket we've had cricket our whole lives and we can definitely relate i'm sure the listeners out there will just love the message that you're putting out there and, and what you're doing for aspiring cricketers all over the country and the world um, and i can't wait to get stuck into some of these youtube videos when you're um when you're over in melbourne i'm gonna have to book you in for about an hour i need to work on that uh that offside so thanks again mate and uh all the best for what's next well, now that you guys are out of lockdown, hopefully, I used to come to Melbourne two or three times a year and have a, quite a lot of clients over there. So now that you're out of lockdown, hopefully I can get over there before the end of this summer and we can I'll give you a hit and then we can go for a beer or two. Awesome. Fantastic. I That's could good. desperately use that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for again, me, guys. Man. Cheers. Thank you. Well, Rubes, Skulls was as good as I thought it would be. Uh, an absolute gun. We we do love our friends from the West. Um, it's fair to say I'm a little bit biased in that regard, but so much to take in from that. And I just love how, you know, he, he's a, he started off as a cricket coach, but what he does appeals to not only cricketers, but just people in general mm. and, and just in general life. Uh, so awesome to chat with him. Uh, what did you take away from that? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing that people listening to this um, can be doing after listening to Skulls is create a social media account out of your passion. If this has been on your mind for a while, this is your reminder to get started. 
And I think Tom is a brilliant example of someone who had an idea and just got started and then learned about the importance of content along the way. So if you're not already creating your own content, get out there and start doing it right away. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that stood out to me was like just the quality of mentors that he has. I think he reeled off four or five people that Mm. are absolutely relevant to the work that he does. And they're not only just people he's met on the journey, but also like friends, people he's worked with. It's a whole array of different people. And he spoke about how important they've been to him growing his business, you know, his day-to-day, what he does, you know, how he approaches different things day-to-day. And that just stood out to me as being something that, you know, people should just be getting on the front foot really early to find those people in their life. It doesn't need to be, you know, directly uh, involving your job. Just find some people that you trust and appreciate their point of view and have, you know, have had some success in the past that you can just bounce ideas off because Skulls mentioned like he, he rings people daily just to chat about batting and he talks to other people at other times for, you know, just general business advice, like things like that. So if I'm listening, I'm finding a, try and find one, but I mean, Hey, don't stop at one. Might as well try and get five. Mm. And if you like Skulls, Find Chris Rogers, who's a superstar of Australian cricket, to have in your corner. Yeah. Um, but uh, if people want to learn more about how to do that, we've we've done an episode on this in the past. I forget what number it is. I'll put a, a link to it in the show notes so people Not can like find you. it. You usually know all the. I'm numbers. usually pretty good with the uh, sports grad podcast directory, but um, I thought I thought you do two hours of research every night about the numbers in the past. Yeah, I, I don't like being caught <laughs> off guard, so um, preparation is key for that. Uh, unfortunately my preparation has failed me here but <laughs> we will we will put a link in the show notes uh where we yeah. go through all the steps on the how to do that so check that out if you want to find a mentor absolutely i love a fun end to the show i do <laughs> and i love pulling the piss out of you sometimes just for clarity ruben does not do two hours every night of research but i'd like to think so by the amount of knowledge he has on episode numbers so <laughs> anyway rubes um Thank you for joining me once again. Uh, for those listening, be sure to connect with us on LinkedIn. We'd love to chat with you on there. You can find a link in the show notes to do so. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.